Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. Today I want to explore what life is like for Christian women artists in the TV and movie business with Nancy Stafford, known to millions as Andy Griffith's law partner on TV's Matlock, and Nina May, an award-winning independent filmmaker. Together with Nancy starring and Nina producing and directing, they have collaborated on a terrific new romantic comedy, First Lady, premiering this Valentine's Day. Nancy has been a series regular on six TV shows and has several upcoming movies. As an author, she's written two best-selling books. Nina, the founder of Renaissance Women Productions, has also written and directed the award-winning Daily Bread and Life Fine Tune. There's a lot I want to dig into, but uh, let's start with the First Lady. Nina, you're, uh, I think you thought this one up. Uh, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. It's a um, fun romantic comedy. We're calling it a modern fairy tale for the whole family. And uh, I, it, I came up with the idea years ago when someone asked me, because um, I was very involved politically, and they said, Nina, would you ever consider running for president? And I said, no, but I'd love to be first lady. And it just came out of my mouth, and I, it just always was in there. What would that look like with someone running for first lady? And I actually did the research and found out that there have been actually nine, that you use this a lot, nine first ladies that are non-spousal, they're not married to the president. Really? Uh, yeah, but Isn't none that amazing? of them. No, it, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. But none have ever run for the office of first lady because is there really an office of the first lady? We don't really know. So I pulled together sort of a little bit of a plot, and immediately, and I've known Nancy probably for about twenty years, I guess, and she just immediately came to my mind as being the perfect person to cast as first lady. So I sent her the script, and I, I was selling her on the phone. I said, Nancy, I've got the script. I want you to look at it, and I think you'd be perfect for it. Well, I never heard back from her, and she didn't hear back from me, so she's thinking, well, I guess she chose someone else, and I'm thinking, well, I guess she didn't like it. It was the well, wildest well, thing. Well, having seen the, the movie, you, you, know you were the right choice. She picked me, totally, fortunately. How do you react to this idea? Well, I loved it, and so I immediately wrote Nina back, to which she never got the email, and then we ran into each other about a year later, I guess, at a media summit, Christian media summit, and she, I said, whatever happened to First Lady? And she said, yeah, I thought you didn't like it. So from that moment on, and that's been, what, 18 months? But 18 uh, months. So. Since that regrouping to us distributing it, 18 months, which is absolutely unheard of in this industry. Yeah, well, as you know, you know as a producer, of. I mean, yeah. that just yes. never happened. That's fast. But you, but you talk about Christian women. <laughs> it was a miracle, actually, that I did not get her email because I had to decide between pulling the trigger on first late. I guess you can't say that, pulling the trigger on first lady. <laughs> starting, no, that's, uh... starting production on first lady. Or this um, post-apocalyptic dramatic series that I had already also written called uh, Daily Bread. And since I didn't hear back from her, I said, well, you know what? I'll, everything's set for Daily Bread. Let's go ahead and start our casting calls and everything. And so it was almost exactly to the minute that we finished Daily Bread that we did this um, conference together and we regrouped on First Lady. I learned so much on Daily Bread that I applied to First Lady. If I jumped into First Lady without doing the, the TV series first, I don't think it would be nearly as good as it is. So I believe that was God's hand saying, I know what you're supposed to do first. Nina, don't worry about whether Nancy's got the script or not. I got it all under control. And it was, it's two really great projects, well, I think. Well, Nancy, I, I you know, watch the film. It's a, a film that, it's about politics in part, but it's not political. I know. Isn't I couldn't. I can't figure out which party you were in. Actually, I, thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you. Exactly. That was the point. That was the yes. point. Okay. That was the point. That's exactly. We wanted right. to set it in the well. Nina wanted to set it in the world of presidential politics, but be apolitical, totally non-political, mm -hmm. and especially right now in this climate we're in, where yeah. everything is heightened and heated and divisive. Um, here comes First Lady. You mm -hmm. know about set in this world, but is a chance for everybody to come across the aisle and laugh and just come together for once mm -hmm. and just enjoy 90 minutes in a theater and um, have some hope and have some fun. Medis uh, laughter is medicine for the soul, and we need it. Well, I have, a, I have something I have to disclose. Okay. 
<laughs> Nina had first talked with me about playing the part of the president. You would have been great. Yeah. Well, except she killed me off in the first oh, the yeah. first four <laughs> minutes. And you wanted a bigger role. <laughs> I, wanted a, I wanted a bigger role. Like, a you second. would have been great, but Joel King, who plays <laughs> he was good. President, he was, very he was good. fabulous. He was great. Oh. So what was the, the idea is that just t give us a quick plot summary so we know. Well, basically it's a woman who is the first lady, but her husband dies in office, and his dying wish or request is that she helped the vice president in his bid for running for office because an election is coming up. And um, she doesn't know what to do. And that it's the girls that give her the idea, her aides that give her the idea. And it's like, well, it's never been done before. Well, none of this has been done before. And why are we doing it? So anyway, so she agrees to do it. And then the fun begins. And it basically, it pits her then, even though she helps him get to, into office, you have to have conflict in a movie. It can't be, well, OK, that was a fun movie you got to have conflict. So I made the conflict between her and the president it, because now he's thinking that everybody loves her. She's more popular than him. She got him the elected. The, the, the young the, man who was, young vice man was vice president is now, now the president. president. Now, he's, yeah. now he's jealous. Jealous. He's a little okay. And threatened. Threatened, exactly. Well, I, I can exactly. see why. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, Kate, my character, Kate Morales, was beloved. So, exactly. you know, I can see it too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the, the an, real antagonist of her is um, Mallory Carrington, who it would be the would have been the first lady had her husband won. And that's really why the, she did this. She said, we've got to protect the dignity of the position of first lady. And she's all about protocol. She's all about history. Who, and who she play, is a history who, who, professor. Who played that part? Oh, um, Tanya, Tanya Christensen. Christensen. She's over the top. She was hysterical. She and yeah. she was a doll to work with. And yeah. all those were her clothes. Really? She brought her home her polka dots. <laughs> polka she dots owns those bowls. polka dots. And I know, big flowers, and she was hysterical. She I, is a friend of mine. I've known yes. her for a long time. She lives mm -hmm. in Florida, actually. And as soon as I read this script, I called Nina and said, I know who needs to play this role. And she just nailed she it. Na she, she steals the it. movie, which delights me no end. I mean, really, it's, she's wonderful. The cast is great. How'd you pull together the cast? Another miracle. I'm telling you, that we cast that whole thing in about four weeks, maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. if that. And I knew Nancy, because she said, are you going to do it? She's already in. I'd already talked to Stacy Dash about something. So I said, hey, Stacy, we're doing this movie. When are you finishing yours? She was, oh, in about such and such time. I said, great. Come on out over with us. I talked to um, Joe Battaglia, who was a very dear friend, and he's knee deep in the industry. And I said, Joe, I'm looking for a, an actor in their 60s, 65. They can do romantic comedy. And da, 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 da. He immediately said, well, what about Corbin? Corbin, Corbin, Corbin Bernson. I yeah, said, Corbin Bernson? I mean, the rough, tough policeman in your face. He, he, was, he was in L.A. Law. Yeah, he was in L.A. He's in Psych. I mean, he does a lot of different movies. And I was going, are you sure he could do, like, romantic comedy? I don't oh, see. And Joe so was funny. like, oh, no, absolutely. He said, I tell you what, send me the script, and I'll get it to him. And I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll hear back, but I'm going to continue my search. Well, he, Corbin calls me back, like, within four hours. Oh, my goodness. Yes, and said... I love the script. I want to do it. I thought, oh. And then it was just downhill from there, getting everyone else. And, it was, and he was so charming. He was. He was he? delightful. Just mm -hmm. cute and fun. Perfect choice. Perfect yeah. choice. And he even did the little accent that he kind of worked on a little bit. Well, you bit. gave him a hard problem. He was doing a foreign accent, but you didn't name the country. <laughs> well, Moldovanique. <laughs> Moldovanique. Yeah, okay. So. It's a made-up country. So. And I even told him that. So I we said, got a made-up accent. That's exactly did, right. Totally and, I, and I put everyone in his, all his extra guys from all over. I mean, it was very eclectic. You know, they had black and white and young and old and Hispanic and Filipino and everything. So nobody could guess what country it was because I don't even know what country it is. It's just Moldovanique. And he and yeah. I used to laugh because um, his accent would, would vary from scene <laughs> to scene. <laughs> you know? And sometimes he'd be a little more French and sometimes more Austrian. And I mean, it was hysterical. But it was, it was I think it was. But it's a comedy, so you can do that. As an actress, how do you prepare for a role like this? Well, you know what? Um, it was so beautifully written on the page, and mm -hmm. that helps. It starts with the writing. If the writing's good, then so much is given to you. So um, what I did when I learned, first of all, that, that there were nine non-spousal first ladies, I started looking at that. But then I decided, you know, who are the, the, what are the attributes of the first ladies that I most admire? So um, I called from the fierceness and the ferocity and the loyalty of Barbara Bush and the grace and dignity and humor of Laura Bush, uh, Nancy Reagan and her dignity, and um, even uh, M Melania Trump and her grace under huge pressure. Right. So um, I kind of 
com made a composite figure using some of the best qualities. And what I loved about what she wrote for Kate is that she is a woman who is steeped in history. She's a history professor, and she chooses to do everything she can to preserve. She loves government, and she mm -hmm. loves protocol, and she loves dignity. Mm -hmm. So, and but but fiercely flawed. <laughs> so she was fun, but Sweet. yeah. Uh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with Nancy Stafford and Nina May, and we're talking about their new movie, First Lady. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So it, it comes out on uh, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, February 14th. And, I had uh, some guy ask me today, what day's Valentine's Day? I said, you're not married, are you? <laughs> I, I admitted to not being sure about that uh -oh. date, so <laughs> just this morning. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Corbin Burson co-stars with you, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was shot mainly in location here in the Washington area. Yeah, mm -hmm. in Fairfax and Rappahannock counties, basically. Oh, and in uh, Texas is where all the Oval Office scenes were shot in Longview, Texas, in someone's replica of the Oval Office. It was now, great. Now, I, I want to talk with you both about separate but similar things. I, I want to talk with uh, Nancy about how, how you proceed in a very successful career in Hollywood um, as a very serious Christian when Hollywood is not exactly uh, that. <laughs> and and I, I want to talk with you about how, you, how you, you've, you've now made three films. And you pull this together, and a three, lot of people think features, about yeah. making a movie. Yeah. How that happens? Right. Um, sure. Who? Who? Let's let's start Beanie, with Nancy. Beanie, start with Nemo. Okay. Well, you um, were you were you were uh, Miss Florida in I the Miss America Miss contest, America. Mm -hmm. and then became a Ford model, yep. which is a big deal, a very big deal. It, and, it was uh, fun. <laughs> you were in like three hundred commercials before you uh, started acting. Yeah. I start, in fact, what's funny is I actually started, it was my, not my intention at all. I was actually a journalism grad from college, and I was working in the marketplace and got a call from an agent in Miami who s desperately said, I've got all these ad agencies coming to Miami to shoot these big commercials in the winter. And, I, and Screen Actors Guild, the actors union, was on strike. She says, I'm desperate. And I said, well, thanks for thinking of me. And she uh, said, would you just come and audition? And I auditioned for five big national spots in one week, and I got them all. And that's what started it. I got, out of nowhere, I got Coca-Cola and p and I mean, big national commercials. And I got bitten by the bug. So I started doing more commercials and decided to move to New York to study. I didn't go to model. I went to study acting. So I enrolled in Stella Adler Conservatory. Mm -hmm. and was in class 18 hours a day, it felt like. Modeling on the side, doing a lot of commercials. And started then working in a soap in New York. That was my first. Job. So uh, Ford, that was sort of famously nurturing as an agency, didn't yeah. they? Take care back in those days. Yeah, these young, vulnerable women would come yes. to New York mm -hmm. and and uh, and they'd Ford... often stay at at Aunt Eileen's home. Yeah. Um, and she was very much like a mama hen, very protective of her girls. Now I was a little older. I was 24 years old when I signed with Ford. Which at the time it is could be like, like eight years older, or seven, you know, six or seven or eight years older than Mata. Yes, mm -hmm. at yeah. least. Mm -hmm. And um, but she said, you know, but she says you're old. When I first met her there, she looks at me. She goes, "You're really old." And this is her voice. I'm doing her voice. You're old. And I said, "Oh, well, yeah, thank you." But she says, "But I'll hire. I'm going to work with you because you're going to make me a lot of money." <laughs> oh wow! And I did make. A and lot you did. Of money. Yeah, well, that's good for you. Well, Nina, when did you get the bug to start uh, making movies, film? I, th I think I've always loved production, anything dealing with production. And um, I remember in high school, like, for example, during you're talking about beauty contests, all the beauty contests or all these shows or all the anything, I didn't want to be on the stage. I wanted to be behind the stage. I wanted to, like, run the camera. I wanted to tell, tell them where to put the lights, where to put the sets. Oh, the sets, can I redesign the set? for? You? I just love the whole concept of production. I don't know what it was. But years ago, I, I, and I'm not going to tell you which movie it was because I'm embarrassed that I was in it. I was an extra in a movie. I'll give you a tiny bit of a hint. It won Best Picture, but I'm still embarrassed that I was in it. So I know. <laughs> ding, okay, ding, we ding, get 20 ding, questions ding, here. Ding. Yeah. So, but I was a, um, okay, I'll give you another hint. I was, <laughs> I was an FBI trainee with Jodie Foster. And so Ooh. I was with so her for like... So this was a Scorsese movie, maybe? No. Silence no. of the Lambs. Oh, the I know. If I don't want anyone going to see it, just because... Okay. Anyway, so... <clears throat> but be, because I was right there on the set every single day for literally three weeks, 
I'm this close to the director every day. I'm this close to the director of photography. I'm seeing everything around me. I'm hearing what he's telling this person, that person. And I was just going, oh my gosh, I'm fascinated. I wanted to get out of being an extra so bad that I could just, y'all go do your stuff. I want to just sit here and listen at, you know, the foot of the master right here. And I, I couldn't get that out of my head, that it was so much fun. But what really inspired me to realize I could do it was when the Kendrick brothers, I saw them on Fox News one morning, they had taken $100,000 during their, not taken, their church had invested $100,000 in them to do their first movie. They'd never done anything before. They'd never acted. They'd never written a script. They'd never done anything before. And Sony picked it up, and I think they ended up making like $20 million or something. And it, it reminded me of what my thought has always been about making movies. You do not need to spend a gazillion dollars to make a movie. You just have to have a really good script, good directing, good acting. And then, of course, distribution so everyone can see it. But I would look at those budgets in Hollywood and go, that shouldn't cost $10 million. That shouldn't cost five. It shouldn't cost one. I found out what a line producer was, and I said, can I see your budget? And I'm looking at the budget, budget and go, you don't need that. You don't need that. You certainly don't need 20 of those. You don't... Are you paying that guy that much? And so I would see these fifty or five million dollar budgets, ten million dollar budgets. Scratch, 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 scratch. Okay, now now I'll do that for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Of course, you're. So, <laughs> look, let's be plain. You, I've known you for a while. Yes, you have. And I think the first time I met you, you were on a uh, on a tractor or a bulldozer. Uh, my bobcat. And you've yeah. got a you've got in your bio here that in your spare time you like to work on construction projects, yes, serving I as do. general contractor. I love. It's a it. pretty good background to produce a movie. Yeah. But it comes same, in handy. But it's the same <laughs> thing. If you think about it, you start with a blueprint. You start with a script. You know, you know what your contractors are going to be. You know who your cast and crew is going to be. You, and so you just build it from the bottom up, and then you get to um, furnish this or colorize and do the foley and the, and sweetening the sound and everything on that. And they they're so similar. I mean, it's creating and building. It's project management. Yeah, mm -hmm. and she I does. just I love that. I mean, I really do. Yeah. So you went on. Uh, from modeling to Hollywood TV, mm -hmm. when did you get your part in Matlock? Um, actually, I was brought from New York to do a <clears throat> show called St. Elsewhere, okay. um, which was, I uh, did the first th three, the set three seasons, second, third, and fourth year. They brought in my character with Mark Harmon. So I did that show. That's what brought me to LA. And then when that show ended, then I got a TV series called Sidekicks. For a year on ABC and Disney and um, when that show was canceled sadly it was a lovely show but terrible time slot um, Matlock came along and um, his daughter her first season had just left the show and they were looking for his new law partner perfect timing for when I was exiting my other show and they brought me in to do this one I did that show for five years did you like Andy Griffith loved Andy Griffith oh my gosh who doesn't love Andy Griffith <laughs> No, he was... He was a wonderful actor. He made that uh, movie, What, A Face in a the Crowd? Face in the Crowd. In the mm -hmm. late 50s? Yeah. You know, if your viewers and listeners have not seen Andy Griffith in A Face in the Crowd, they must. He is terrifying in yeah. this role. Yeah, And it will What's show you... Lon Andy Lonesome Griffith. Rose. Played yes, Lonesome Rose. Yes, Lonesome Rose. Wow. Elmer Gandry, <laughs> a Gandry kind of character. Yeah. Um, Gandry. Yeah. And he was... But, I mean, my goodness, he was an American icon... I mean, created two of the most iconic, distinctive, culture-making characters with Andy of Mayberry. I mean, mm -hmm. look what he created for our our country. People I still mean, watch it. People too. watch it. They yeah. love it. And he did the same, really, for Matlock. So I adored him. We had we laughed every day, and it was like a master class for me every day. What, what do you teach? You, what do you teach you about acting? Because part of what I want to oh. convey here is what what the craft is that you're uh, engaged yeah. in. Yeah, what, yeah. what do you teach you about acting? Um, a number of things, um, not the least of which is um, impro improvising, staying true to the script, but the capacity to improvise within the confines of lines, which is sounds counterintuitive, but is a wonderful gift that he exhibits all the time. Mm -hmm. um, he, for instance, he used to do, if your viewers remember the ubiquitous courtroom scenes every episode, um, where he gives his final summation speech. And it's a long, it's like a five pager. It's long. He would do that as a monologue. He memorized it, he would tell me, as a monologue. And then he would deliver this thing in one take. 
he was basically one take Andy. So we have the gallery full of, of people. We got the jury full. The courtroom is packed with people, extras and, and actors. And he would stand up and give his, do the summation scene, usually in one take. We never had to even do a safety. He got a standing ovation almost every time. I mean, he's remarkable. His work ethic was astounding. I've always had a good work ethic, but it was great to see a veteran say, I'm coming in at 5, and I'm getting ready, and I'm leaving it at 5 at night, but he mm. went straight to bed. I mean, his work ethic yeah, was yeah. unbelievable, and he cared deeply about the character of, of Matlock. So he was making constant changes with the writers because of the character. I learned so much from him. Plus, he was just fun. Oh, my gosh. Some of my most fun moments, he, you know, he'd bring his guitar on set and play. And my husband's a fabulous musician, and he would he'd sidle up to me sometimes, and he'd go, hey, Nancy, call Larry, see if he'll bring his mandolin over. And um, <laughs> just, he was great. You're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Nina May and uh, Nancy Stafford, and we're talking about... Nancy's career uh, at, uh, early on working with Andy Griffith and Matt Locke and also the role her husband Larry Myers played in the <laughs> career early on. Uh, you have a friend of mine, good friend, Colby May. Yes. Uh, has he been involved with you in, in the making he, of your I movies? I always make him the executive producer. And everyone in the I industry I don't think executive producers do any work, though, do they? <laughs> no, but they cha-ching. <laughs> <laughs> Right. A different kind of work. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, he works. And he's also okay. our lawyer, too, so that helps a lot. That saves you that a lot. That saves the cha-ching. Oh, my exactly. goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. So uh, pulling together the financing for something like this, how do you how do you do a, how do you get a program? Um, how do you get we, a show going? We do these through our foundation, our Renaissance Women Production, Renaissance Women Foundation. The Renaissance Women Productions is a project of it and because it's all educational. What we're trying to do is find undiscovered talent, especially young kids that feel called into the industry and give them an opportunity in front of or behind the camera in real life production so that they don't have to feel they got to go out to Hollywood and do the, the casting couch or that Me Too stuff because it happens. I've seen, and this is what inspired me to do this. I saw some of these young, gorgeous girls that had, and they were like, you know, the, the Miss High School and the, the star of that show in college or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, you got to go to Hollywood. You're so, so good. They would come back absolutely broken. It's like their souls had been destroyed because they couldn't make it out there because they were expected to do things they would not do. And I said, you shouldn't have, I would be yelling, why'd you do that? You shouldn't have done that. Well, what are my options? And I started thinking about that. What are their options? You know, no one's going to just take someone that's never been on stage and go, hi, I'm going to cast you in this. I mean, that would be like, Well, that's one of the things saying? about your movies is you do have an ensemble. You've got a group of young people that work go from production to production, mm -hmm. and this is Renaissance Women's Production. Renaissance Women Productions, but, yeah. and it's like I said, it's a project of Renaissance Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization, basically. So, and you know, another thing I love about the model that Nina has, um, she is well for two things. Through her foundation, and because she is discovering un undiscovered and undeveloped talent oftentimes and putting them both behind the camera to learn things as well as in front. Um, she's all about mentoring. And I've, I'm all about mentoring too in, on the other coast in Hollywood because I think it's so important for us to raise up this next generation of storytellers and create mm -hmm. creative content developers. Mm -hmm. And so it's very exciting, I think, to be able to be a part of working with someone who doesn't yet hasn't honed their craft yet, but because we can teach them by, even if they only watch, mm -hmm. they're getting a chance by osmosis. Yeah. I mean, that's how I learned set etiquette. That's how I learned to be a professional was watching intently. I mean, I've always been a sponge. Everybody I've ever worked with, like, how are they doing that? What do they do? How do you, how do you respond? And so she's giving them a chance to do that. And also what I love is that um, she's proving, as are many independent filmmakers, that there is life outside of Hollywood. Yeah. You don't have to be within the confines of the Hollywood system mm -hmm. to be an effective filmmaker and a successful one. Mm -hmm. exactly. You all, you mentioned Me Too. I mean, what's, yeah. is this, I'm not that close to this, so what is, yeah. how do, what, what's your take? On the Me Too movement? Yeah. Um, you want to go, that's sort of your 
neck of the woods. I don't really, we don't really deal with it out in Rappahannock right. County. Well, thank you, Nina. No, no, but, oh, no, but us just came by. All right, here comes here comes here comes the high beam spot. Well, well, you're no, under, because, you're under, because the, you're under the lights. No, because that is your industry. I mean, again, yeah. the stuff that I'm doing in writing and producing. But they you know, it is across so many industries now. People yeah, are coming for. But yeah. but um, I'll I'll, t I'll be honest with you. I I should be highly offended. I've never had a Me Too situation <laughs> in my entire career, and I'm really upset about it right now. Um, <laughs> but um, but there are a lot of women who have had that that problem. And but what, here's honestly, for those for the Harvey Weinstein's and the real awful characters, I am. It's despicable. It's disgusting, and it's about time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of others that I, that suddenly 20 years down the road when it feels a little convenient and they were quiet when it actually happened because they were ambitious for their own career and they thought it would hurt them, they, would, they were willing to do what it took to get there, mm -hmm. but now they want to come out and destroy a life. And I don't yeah. know, I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. I go, you know, I'm all about, if, you know, if, you, if, you, if, if someone has done something to me, I'm either going to extract myself from the situation or I'm going to um, make it loud and clear. And if it's bad enough, you bring charges against them. Absolutely. You go to the police, you say, this happened to me. You well, and you're tough, out. tough people. You handle it. It's, it's you know, mm -hmm. my wife Sarah's on the set. I'm going to, she's bursting to come on the set because she Wonderful. agrees with you uh, yeah. that <sighs> it, 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 it goes both ways and there is a little it bit of, a little bit it's of coming. Very, sure. It's been very, quite self-serving in, in so many of these situations. And so I want to scream sometimes when, these charges come out now, so many years later. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I have a tough time with it. But I also know that if young women who do come out to Hollywood or young men or whoever it is, if they have enough self-respect um, and have enough integrity that they can just say no, then, you know, they may not get that one role. So what? I've had not quite that situation, but I've had a lot of situations where um, the type of work offered wasn't what I wanted to do. Now, I wasn't assaulted, and I wasn't threatened or harassed. Mm -hmm. I was just not hired or fired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a cost to stand up for your beliefs and to be who you know you're supposed to be. So mm -hmm. you pay the price. True. Um, going back to the discoveries of uh, the new people that we have, if you've watched the movie, you know her age. She's got three aides, you know, Bailey, Channing, and Macy. There's four professionals on that set. There's one of the four of them that has never acted before, never been in front of a camera, never done that. And I'm telling you what, she absolutely held her own. It was Melissa Timmay. She was brilliant. She was amazing. And I was so proud of her. because Yeah, I you couldn't tell. You could not tell. She did an amazing job, an amazing job. And there were several others like that, too. But she's the one that really became, in my eyes, my star of discovery for that, mm -hmm. for that show, for yeah. the movie. So you also produce Daily Bread and Life Fine Tune. What are, what are those? Daily Bread is a post-apocalyptic dramatic series. We've got 12 um, episodes out, 45 minutes each. Literally, it's like making six movies in a year and a half. But um, a solar flare knocks out electricity around the world, and these seven millennial girls who are the cast and crew of a cooking show are stranded on a farm, and they have to figure out They're how the to... They're the cast and crew of a, a, cook, cook, a cooking show. A cooking, a cooking show. show. Yeah. I know it sounds silly. It's like, oh, that sounds like a great comedy. But no, it's serious. I mean, because th there's no electricity, and how are you going to well, survive? Well, you like to mix your plots, I know. Yeah. Because it, life, you know, the... Uh, um, First Lady, we've got both Prince and the Pauper theme and exactly. the Vice President. Exactly. Anyway, that, so. yeah. No, I do. I like to sort of layer things in. It's more fun that way. But um, but and I, we were literally stuck for two years in camo because it was post-apocalyptic. We had guns. We had blowing up Tannerite. We had survival. And then I went from camo to glamo, and I love that. <laughs> and it was really like, phew. Oh, I'm just go tired of this. Even my, you've seen my suitcase. It's a camo suitcase. So I really immersed myself into the production. But uh, we've won a lot of awards for that. It's on DirecTV. It's on Amazon Prime. It's it's all over and everything. But um, and then Life Fine Tune was my very first feature length. I had done several um, what are they called documentaries and tons of shorts, but I'd never done a feature length. 
And we won the International Family Film Festival out in California, beating out a DreamWorks and a Disney movie. Shocking me. I had no idea. And I was just telling her today as a result of that, oh, we beat out two Chinese movies. And as a result of that, the Chinese American Film Festival said, can we show your movie at our film festival, which is kind of like their Oscars. And I was, I looked at the catalog, and it's like, okay, you got, you know, Men in Black and you know the Avengers, and you know, you you knew every single one of the movies. And there's a little life fine tune right there, and it was like, wow, thank you. It was a, it was very cool. It was pretty exciting. Well, the thing that's interesting about both of you is you're, you're artists, but you also have an overarching mission to I think bring. I know Christianity to to the world, but also people's self esteem, self worth, right. all that. I mean, that's a, you're, exactly. you're both very mission driven in that regard. Yeah. I mean, you've it's written about excellence basically for both of us. I mean, Nancy, you've said something like uh, she speaks in corporate settings where she motivates, inspires, and challenges others to live lives of significance and pursue their dreams with excellence. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. But then Nina, we have saying. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> she wants people to be leaders, not followers. Yeah. Winners, not whiners. Uh -huh. Victors, not victims. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you're singing the same music, but in different keys. Yeah. That's very good. <laughs> exactly. That's very good. That was when I first started Renaissance Women years ago. That was kind of the motto that I would say, because we were pitted up against the feminists who were wanting to speak for all women. I said, excuse me, time out. I can speak for myself. Do not need you speaking for me. Definitely don't need you voting for me or, or believing what you believe. I, I got my own mindset here. So that was the, the uh, leaders, not followers part. And, of course, the, the winners, not whiners. Well, I can't do this because I'm a woman and there's a glass ceiling. And, oh, just do it. Just stop. And then the victors, not victims, you know, we're just doing it. We're not going to sit there saying, oh, I can't do it because I'm a victim, because I'm a woman and the system is against me, you know, going, Seriously? Well, then why are the rest of us doing it? Mm. You know, it just, it would just drive me crazy that they were winning. You thought? And in my case, as far as being someone that really wants to motivate, and I, especially women, I mean, I speak to mixed audiences too, but my heart really is for women. And it comes from a very personal place because I grew up, though I had an affirming family and a fabulous family, I had such a deep sense of unworthiness and inadequacy and insecurity that I don't, I can't really explain where it came from. But I so just, you're Miss you're Miss Florida I was Ford Miss, model. I know, <laughs> but I was totally the nerd, the geek, the dork of my school growing up, and yeah. it, it was I mean it it was crazy, and I was highly sensitive, but it wasn't until and it wasn't even getting Miss Florida and becoming successful in the business that helped me overcome those feelings. It was a relationship with God. It was having the Father speak to me the truth of what he thought of me, not what I think of myself. Mm -hmm. So instead of being bound by my past or my warped self-perceptions, he overrode the lies with truth. That is why I think that we care so deeply, and I do especially, about women, because all these things we've talked about, um, even the, the Me Too movement and the temptation to do whatever you need to do to get a man to love me, to get a job, to get somebody to like me, it's obliterated when we come to the place once and for all of knowing that I am loved unconditionally by an everlasting God who accepts me exactly as I am. I don't have to remake myself or subject myself mm -hmm. to your approval. And it changes everything. It changes the landscape. And those are the themes. I mentioned the books at the outset. One of them is Beauty by the Book, Seeing Yourself as God Sees You. And the latest, your latest one is Wonder of His Love, Journey into the Heart of God. Mm -hmm. And that's so. If we pick up that, that's where that's all in those I books. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, and I write what I need. I'm very selfish. I write <laughs> what I need, and I figure if I need it, maybe somebody else does too. Oh, okay, so great. when you sit out to write a book, you're thinking the audience is me. Me. Okay. Because you know yeah, what? We're all alike. Good. We all, yeah. whether we admit it or not, or to some degree or another, we really do wrestle with so many of the same things. Mm -hmm. And whether you're an actress or, you know, in the public eye or you're a plumber or a, a, a housekeeper, we we really do, at the heart of hearts, um, need to be affirmed yeah, that we're yeah, okay. I, I so agree in this age of identity politics where you're this or you're that or this, but we're all right. basically human beings. Yes. Right, exactly. Yes. And we're made in God's image. What's cool about it, if we are made in God's image and we have these feelings, that means God understands those feelings oh because we're goodness. made in his image. And it's so cool. So you just go to the creator and say, 
hi, I'm dealing with something. He goes, oh, I so get it. I made you that way, but let me tell you how you, there's a workaround on this thing. And, and it's, it's and so cool. It's a relationship. And this is what I love, too, about God, is that he uses, and see, this is something that is sometimes lost on our culture. Um, God uses all of our brokenness for the sake of other people. So he allowed me to have all this background and stuff I wrestled with for the longest time, knowing that years later, I was going to be able to speak about and write about and minister to other people who are going through the same thing. He redeems all things. And that is what's so amazing and beautiful and um, miraculous, really, about our walk with him. You're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with uh, Nancy Stafford and Nina May, and we're talking about the role of faith and God in their careers. And and uh, it's a pretty moving uh, moving conversation. Nina, want to amplify? Um, I, as a creator, and you, I know Sarah's a creative, you're a creative, I am so... Um, for the excited. listener viewers, Sarah's off camera. She's, I'm, she's yeah. about. She's dying to join. We love her. <laughs> Come <laughs> on, Sarah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the fact that God, the Creator of the universe, calls us to be co-creators with Him. That means if we rely on Him, we partner with Him, we have a relationship with Him. I'm telling you what the the um, I call them downloads, the downloads, the, the discernment, the um, the revelations, the all this information that you're getting from the Lord, it it goes towards something positive because you go, I never thought of that. I had this problem. I didn't know that was the solution. Thank you so much. It's like having a relationship with anyone, with a person. It's just you can't see God, but you know him. He's there and you feel him. And and as a Christian, of course, you know, Christ had to die and he left his comfort, which is the Holy Spirit, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's this constant relationship going on, constant. I mean, there are times when Okay, I'll just give you a silly one. You're driving around the city, you're looking for a parking spot, and I go, okay, Lord, you can see it. You see the city. Just show me where the parking spot is. No, and, he, and it's crazy. Are I mean, you it's praying just, for parking spots? Isn't no, that, it's not praying for it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm just using it as an example, as, as a silly example, because the point is, and I say this all the time, if Christ was slain since before the foundation of the earth, our he movie knows was your made. Spot. No, he knows the part of it, but the movie was made. This house was built. I mean, it was it was done. He, he knows it. He sees it. So it's like following a blueprint for building a house. It's following the script for writing a movie. Mm -hmm. There is a script for each one of us. Mm -hmm. God has written a book for each one of us, and all we have to do is say, "Show me my book," because that's the reason I think there's so many people stuck in depression. They go get on drugs. They do something. They have no idea what their destiny is. They're mm -hmm. sitting there going. Why am I even here? What's my purpose? Why was I born? And if they could just plug into the, the thing, the, the, in, the God who created that blueprint for you or the one that created the script for you or wrote the book, I'm telling now, you what, it's yeah. joyful. It's absolute joy. Now, it's amazing. But, but, but that does not, we came, we're talking about First Lady, we're talking yeah. about the movie, her careers and, right. and making things. That, that theme is maybe underlying what your movie's about, but it's, you don't, it's not no, a heavy, no, no. You're it's, not, we're not talking about no, 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 it doesn't lie, no, this no is... it underlies the, the making of it, the yeah, understanding okay. that, wow, you don't have to worry about that. Think about the miracle again, in 18 months to go from basically development to distribution is just absolutely unheard of. And what I did, I said, okay, Lord, you want me to do it, you're gonna just have to open all the doors that need to be open, you're gonna have to bring me the right cast, the right crew, make the weather perfect, I'm not going to worry about it because we're a co-creator together. And I'm telling you, the miracles were just fast and furious all the time. Mm -hmm. all, I was just saying yesterday, I could write a book on the making of First Lady, just the miracles, because it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Think about it. When you go to see something, like a show or something, and it was so fabulous, what do you do? You come back and share it. You don't keep it to yourself. You go, I saw the best movie last night. I saw the best opera last night or whatever. You share it. And that's what I believe is as believers, we do. We're sharing this amazing good news about how God is intimately involved in our lives. It's so cool. And in the case of First Lady, because mm -hmm. as, as you're saying, I think when, when we are people, there are so many creative, brilliant movies and television that have been written by people who don't necessarily profess any kind of a faith. But I also know that those of us who do have faith have at our disposal and at our recognition tremendous themes that we can draw from. And one of the great themes of First Lady that is part of the joy and love and hope and humor of it all is, is it, this is a movie about hope. Really, ultimately, it's a movie about second chances. And when uh, 
getting back to Corbin Burnson, who plays our uh, um, European prince, um, and I met him years ago, my character Kate, meets him years and years ago, and then he has followed my career, and then he comes back to see if there's still a spark and can win my heart again. It really does, it's, it gives the audience hope that there can be an autumn romance. You can be a person of age and still have a ch second chance. So we have an opportunity to kind of tap into kind of biblical themes, redemption, restoration, hope, integrity, self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. that um, I think are very special and make for very profound uh, movies and messages. So I think we all got to get everybody to go to these movies. Yeah. You're opening you're opening February 14th. 14th. And that's the opening day, but we'll be out definitely all week, all over the country. But the key is box office that first weekend to determine if they keep you in another week and another week. So Yeah, I've been through that. Everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have. That's why they call it show business, you know. Yeah, oh, you know, it, there's that part. We're going to make this great thing, and now we've got to get, get it distributed. People, yeah, yeah. Get people yeah, I've been, I've been through seat. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a, I think there's a real place for that. We made a couple of movies. I did produce uh, Nine of May, or not, um, Jerry Lewis's last movie, um, Max Rose, mm. which was a lovely story. And then we had Dan Stevens in The Ticket. Yes. And it was about a man who really lo lost his sight and then regained real wisdom about what the world was really about. Mm. But, the, but mm. the interesting thing was the movie opens when he lost his sight. He was blind when it started. He regained his sight. And then he behaved like a complete heel with, as a sighted person. And mm -hmm. It was only when he went back through and realized he'd made all these mistakes that he had the epiphany. It's not heavy-handed. It was, it was directed by, uh, by an Israeli. Hmm. Um, but I think there's a real niche for these kind of, these kind of stories. I do, too. I do, too. And, um, where, where, so where do you excited. think this is going to end up after it's in the theaters? Do you go on Netflix, or how do we, what's, what's distribution well, like we're, now? we're actually getting all kinds of offers from people that want to handle everything from the home entertainment portion of it, the digital, the video on demand, the, da, 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 to the international, to the broadcast. So um, we're trying That's to great. figure out a way to pull it all together under one roof as opposed to piecemealing it out. And again, this is our first time actually in the theaters with the theatrical distribution to this level. I mean, Life Fine Tune, we were in a few theaters, but not to this extent. And having to get the MPA rating was amazing. We got the PG rating, which was jumping through a lot of hoops. It's been an education. And we have been really hands-on on distribution because we want to learn everything. We want to learn everything from soup to nuts because there's so much to know in the in production industry. And if you don't know it, someone can come in and tell you something that's not true and you don't have a clue and then you can you know be signing your life away or whatever so. so nancy you're working on some other projects now what what's that uh... i am um i'm actually um i don't have another acting gig lined up at the moment but i am starting to shepherd some things through the production pipeline and have about three television series and two films that i'm as a producer various, yeah in various stages of production and a couple of them have some real interest at the moment um which is very exciting. And I'm also, um, I directed, co-directed my first feature a couple of years ago in conjunction with Asbury University's film school. Mm -hmm. And then I've got another one I'm slated to do, if we can get funding soon, uh, called Grace, which is a period piece, uh, frontier missionary woman whose husband's killed out in the field, but then she determines that I'm going to go back and blaze the trail and be by myself and, and continue the good work all alone. And are you going to play the frontier? Missionary? I'm supposed to be Grace, yes, and Terrific. I'm directing it. So, well, that's good. How's the business? How's, how's, how's the business changed since you since you entered it? Oh my goodness, it's changed greatly. <laughs> uh, when I entered it, and as a person of faith, um, you know, there were there was more I could, with clear conscience, do and with joy do as an actor than than now. Now it seems like there's there's less that I can do than more. So f over the years, I've turned down a great deal of work. Um, and I, I've been fired by agents who said, you don't want to work. And I said, you have no idea how much I want to work. I just, I don't want that work. And so um, it's been harder. And then as you get older too, a woman of age, it's just harder to find mm -hmm. roles. But God will, just has not let me leave. So he just keeps whispering, it's not over. 
So I want to encourage all your listeners and viewers too that um, if you're still pursuing your dreams, but God doesn't seem to be like plucking you out yet, just hang in, hang tight. Mm -hmm. You're watching the Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with uh, Nancy Stafford and Nina May, and we're talking about uh, the changes in the film business, TV business, and how it's a lot harder to, to find work that you think has a good, solid moral compass as an actress. Yep. Which is, again, why I think these kind of independent productions are so important. I do, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, is that technology has made this possible. When we first did Life Fine Tune, that was about seven years ago, I think, we were on the RED camera, and we had to use the RED camera because it was 4K. And those cameras cost about $250,000. We shot First Lady on 4K using these little Canon things with 4K, all the different... 4K like, means what? Um, uh, it's, it's the resolution. Okay, it's, it's all right. So that you can blow it up yeah. down the side of a barn and you're not going to pixelate or anything like that. It's just, it's required now. It's kind of industry standard being that that big if you want it to be on in the movie theaters. But if we had done that before, you know, and, and buying the, the cameras and renting them and stuff, it was going to cost a ton of money. The editing suites before it went down into um, Final Cut Pro, it was, it, the big Avid, it was like you're flying like a B-72 or something. <laughs> Do they even exist anymore? I don't, I don't think so. A B-70, I don't think a B-72 oh, no, ever what, yeah. what is it called? It's a Learjet. I don't know. You, okay, you're something. flying some big airplane with a bunch of, of things. But now you do Final Cut Pro. Anyone can put it in their own computer. So anyway, the technology has changed, and it's leveled the playing field. That It's not about the money anymore. It really is about being talented, having a good cast and crew that you're working with, you know, good directing, uh, just the good, uh, safe place atmosphere for the mm -hmm. set, and that's very important to me, that everyone feels very comfortable, no divas allowed, no drama or anything like that. Just to have fun, just have fun. Well, but the, the barrier, the technical barriers mm -hmm. are lower, but there's still mm -hmm. really one big barrier, and that big barrier is how you tell a good story. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I say mm -hmm. the script's got to be good. And very few people know yeah. how to tell a good story. Right, exactly. Right. No, that, that's an art. It really is an art. It but is. it doesn't cost anything to tell a good story. You could sit here and tell me a good story. It wouldn't cost us a dime. Well, so I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or say, like, I've got stacks and stacks of scripts that I've already written. It just took my time. It didn't cost me anything. Yeah. But if someone likes one of them and says, oh, my gosh, that's a fabulous story, suddenly it has value. You know, suddenly you can put it into a production, and that story that's just sitting on paper suddenly becomes three-dimensional, and it's touching lives. To me, it's really magical, you know, how the word, the word becomes alive. Mm -hmm. It's very, very cool. Like and that. when I go around talking to students and kids, um, young people in particular, about um, emerge, getting into the industry, you know, I tell them from the get-go, be content creators. Right now, you've got the chance to do that. Start writing. Right. You, you got an iPhone in your pocket? You've got a movie mm -hmm. camera. Yeah. That's all they need nowadays. I mean, it's right. remarkable. Was it Steve Soderbergh's film? Uh, what was the name of that film he did that was Sex shot Sex, and Videotape? Or is that... No, it's he long, did long. I'm dating myself. That was entire 30 film years ago. Was shot on his on an iPhone. Yeah, which is just you know it's, it blows my mind. <laughs> but everybody now can really be a right. content creator. Exactly. But just keep honing your craft, honing your craft. Mm -hmm. So do you like? So how do you pick a pick a project? Good question. Um, I pick them for different reasons. One is, uh, am I moved by it? Do I agree with it? Yeah. Do I agree with the theme or the premise? Um, do I have a, an opportunity to play a character I've never played before? Do I get a chance to stretch a part of me I never had a chance to before? Um, I love playing bad guys, but I kind of have a personal rule, and that is either I don't want to be a glorified bad guy. I want to have a bad guy that's either got some redemption or a uh, consequence mm -hmm. to my actions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a moral compass. Yeah, for me. And not everybody, I mean, I, and I have yeah. fellow believer actors that we all have our different sort of compass. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been great, this guys. Is I'm really happy. Thank you. Nina May, wonderful. Nancy Stafford, producer, director, mm -hmm. star of, uh, of uh, our movie First Lady. First Lady. And That's we're right. opening... Valentine's, Valentine's Day, Day, February 14th. And do you have a website that we can yeah, learn about this? Yeah, firstladymovie.com. Firstladymovie.com. And, right. and Nancy, do you have a website? I do, nancystafford.com. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you. This thank has been you, really Bill. interesting. How and, uh, to be with you. Yeah, what, a, uh, what a creative crew this is. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>
Okay. We should do something together. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining me on the Bill Walton Show and looking forward to having you with us uh, next time. Thanks much. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes. 